We are late tonight because we just had a surprise prayer appointment. We had a young lady come that we had to do an urgent prayer appointment. So here we are. And I was actually going to start out with a story about a prayer appointment we had this week that caused me to decide what I was going to address about a month ago, I got a call from a woman, a medical professional. She was on a vacation with her daughters and they were having a Bible study and one of her daughter's friends during the Bible study had something happen where the woman said it appeared that something demonic had jumped up into the throat of this young woman and started to choke her and she said um, rather than her, she said she could have assumed that it was a medical emergency, but in her spirit, she knew immediately that God shared with her that it was uh, something demonic and she took authority over it spiritually and it immediately stopped. And so she had come to me to talk about that. And so this week she contacted us and said that this young lady was home from college and was having more trouble and asked if we could meet her. So we agreed to see her and she came to visit us. And this young woman's in college. She's not a drug addict. She's a very um, successful young woman, has been churched. She goes to a uh, a very um, respectful large church in the area, one that I highly respect. Um, what has happened is she's having some encounters with something that she herself has become fearful that she has a demon. And it started when she went on a mission trip with her church to Guatemala a few years back and they were listening to a worship song down in Guatemala in this church. And during the worship song, she kind of, as she said, just let herself go. And she, what she called, fell out. And she fell down onto the floor for about two hours. She was out, unconscious, wasn't conscious at all. And then this happened a few more times, always somehow during worship, where she's not present. Sometimes it almost appears life-threatening. And she's become really concerned about this because at times the pain is so great in her chest area. So it, pretty concerning circumstances. So I was asking her a few questions and I asked her, about being born again. I said, can we talk about when were you born again and when did that happen and how did that look? And she didn't have an answer. She honestly couldn't answer that question. I asked her a few more questions and she didn't have a born again experience. She just felt that going, being churched, she was a Christian, believing she was a Christian. She was in a sexual relationship with her boyfriend and she still felt that she was a Christian. She didn't feel that, um, she knew that they probably shouldn't be doing that, but she didn't feel that it was a heaven or hell issue. It came down to it, she was not born again. She did not even understand what born again was. She ended up acknowledging that. And then she asked me, why does my church not tell us about this? Why was this something that was never told to me? We go on mission trips. And I told her, I don't know why that is. I know that this is a pretty common problem that this stuff is not clearly explained in churches. I know quite a few churches that um, this is common because I often ask people, when were you born again? And they don't know how to answer that question. I know that it's also very common when I tell people you cannot be in a sexually immoral relationship, even if it's just with one person, and think that you're going to heaven. The Bible very clearly states that you cannot. So we had, we led her to Christ, and then we dealt with the issue of the demonic successfully, which could not be dealt with before that. 
So it caused me to really think on this a lot because we just encountered that again. But we generally have to return back to the issue of being born again because a lot of times the issue of being tormented by the demonic is the demonic has every right to torment them because they are not even actually born again, which is what protects you from the devil. When I was um, prior to being born again, I know that I had prayed a sinner's prayer multiple times because I was terrified of going to hell. I knew I was going to hell. I was not ready to stop sinning though, so I knew that that prayer did not work because I never stopped sinning. I just went back to my sin. I knew that that prayer had no power because I would return right back to the bars. I would go right back to sinning. I was not moral. However, there came a day when I was so sick of sinning, I could not sin anymore. And I remember the last time I had a drink. A friend of mine actually pushed a drink across the table at me. I had already overdosed. She did not know that. And I looked at that drink and I couldn't drink it. I honestly could not drink it. I was so sick of sinning. I was so sick of all sinning that I had done. I was disgusted. I couldn't do it anymore. I would rather die, which I chose to do. I couldn't sin anymore. I was sick of it. There was nothing left for me. I could not, there was nothing left I wanted to do. I had sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned until I was vomiting out my sin. And then in the, when I'm unconscious and a pastor's wife is praying over me after I've been released from jail to my sister in an overdose, I am miraculously healed by God when she's praying in the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what happened to me because I just know I am instantly, wow, miraculously amazing. I don't even know who I am. I've never been this version of me. I just know I never went through withdrawals. I have a sound mind. I am peaceful. Two things I'd never had. I had not been sober for so long. I didn't even remember what sober felt like. I had been on the edge of DTs for so long. I couldn't even believe that I wasn't trying to find something to, to drink just to stop shaking. Here I was having this experience where I'm now facing a charge and at the same time, I'm just euphoric over how I feel like God loves me. God healed me. God sees me. Why at the most disgusting place in my life did God touch me? How did I find out what happened to me? Well, one week later, I am what I have this assessment with the Rule 25 assessor in the in the town where I got arrested in and she looks at me and she looks at the paperwork of my arrest and she looks at me again and she says you need to help me understand what I'm seeing and what I'm reading because she said what I'm reading and what I'm seeing are not even close to the same thing. She said, you need to tell me what's happened between here and here because she said, there is nothing about this that makes sense. And I told her, I said, I, I honestly don't know. She, I said, I, I was arrested and then my, my sister came to the jail and got me because they wanted someone to take me to the hospital and she brought me to this pastor's wife, wife instead and she's praying over me and then God healed me. And she said, oh, I know what happened. She said, I know what this is. And I said, what is it? She says, you've been born again. I said, what? She says, you've been born again. And I said, oh, she said, I've seen this before. She says, I know what this is. So I found out I had been born again from my rule 25 assessor. So not everybody has that story. 
But I want to talk about being born again because I'm telling you that born again shows up because mine sure did. And my judge in that case, he even said, this is extraordinary. He said, this is an extraordinary circumstance. He said, the court mandate for this charge is inpatient treatment. But he said, this is an extraordinary circumstance. He says, if you keep going to church, I'm not gonna send you to treatment. If you stop going to church, he says, it's no doubt that you'll end up back here and then you'll be going to treatment. I never ended up back there and I'm still going to church 30 years later. That's the power of born again. I never relapsed 30 years later. That's the power of born again. What God starts, God, he finishes. The classic passage from the Bible that answers this question about born again is John 3, 1 through 21. Jesus Christ is talking to Nicodemus, a prominent Pharisee and member of the ruling body of the Jews. Nicodemus had come to Jesus at night with some questions. As Jesus talked with Nicodemus, he said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus asked, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I'll tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The phrase born again literally means born from above. Nicodemus had a real need. He needed a change of his heart, a spiritual transformation, new birth, being born again is an act of God whereby eternal life is imparted to a person who believes, which indicates that being born again also carries the idea of becoming a child of God through trust in the name of Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 verse 1 reads, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, came from God, for no one else can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, meaning go to heaven. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Billy Graham is probably one of the best writers of the gospel. So I'm going to write, take a, a, lot, a 
big portion from what he writes because I want this to be very well enunciated. He writes, this man named Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Perhaps he was afraid of criticism or he had a desire for a private conversation or maybe he, wa maybe he wanted to know more before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came and asked Jesus some questions. Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily. And any time Jesus used that expression, he meant that what was to follow was very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. Have you been born again? Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it saved. But has it happened to you? Does Christ live in your heart? Do you know it? Many people thought a long time about religion and Christianity and yet have never made a commitment. Yet they think they're going to heaven because they deserve to. Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said, you must be born again. It wouldn't seem shocking if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, the tax collector, or to the thief on the cross, or to the woman caught in adultery. But Nicodemus was one of the greatest religious leaders of his time, which would be an equivalent to a pastor of a large church now. Still, he was searching for reality. You may go to church and perhaps you are still searching. There's an empty place in your heart and something inside tells you that you're not really right with God. Nicodemus fasted two days a week. He spent two hours every day in prayer. He tithed. Why did Jesus say that Nicodemus must be born again? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. Jesus saw that Nicodemus had covered himself with religion, but had not yet found a relationship with God. Jesus said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and defile the man. Matthew 15, 18. He said, the problem is in our heart. Our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists, sociologists, and psychiatrists all recognize that there is something wrong with humankind. Many words in scripture describe it. Among them is the word transgression. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? The word sin carries with it the idea of missing the mark, which means coming short of our duty, failure to do what we ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin, 1 John 5, 17. And yet before we can get to heaven, we must have righteousness, God says. Be perfect as I am perfect, holy as I am holy, Matthew 5, 48, 1 Peter 1, 16. Where are we going to get that perfection? We don't have it now, yet we can't get to heaven if we don't have it. That is why Christ had to die on the cross. He shed his blood and rose again to provide the righteousness for us. Another word is iniquity, which means to turn aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. The Bible says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, Thus death spread to all men because all sinned, Romans 5.12. Every person needs a radical change. We need to have our sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God. Nicodemus could see only the physical and the material, but Jesus was talking about the spiritual. How is a new birth accomplished? We cannot inherit a new birth. The Bible says that those who are born again were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, 13. Our fathers and mothers may be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make us born-again Christians also. Many people have the idea that because they were born into a Christian home, they're automatically Christians. They are not. We cannot work our way to God either. The Bible says salvation comes not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5. Nor is reformation enough. We can say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf, but Isaiah said 
that in the sight of God, all of our righteousness is filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. Some of us have changed on the outside to conform to church standards or behavior that is expected of us in social settings, but down inside, we've never changed. That's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing on the inside and only the Holy Spirit can do that. Being born from above is a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He disturbs us because we have sinned against God. And then the Holy Spirit regenerates us. That is when we are born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live in our hearts to help us with our daily lives. The Spirit of God gives us assurance, gives us joy, pr produces fruit in our lives, and teaches us the Bible. Some people try to imitate Christ. They think that all we have to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things he did. And then we will get to heaven. But we can't do it. We may know all the religious songs. We may say all the prayers. But if we haven't been to the foot of the cross, we have not been born again. And that is the message that Jesus is trying to teach. To be born again means that God will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Ezekiel 36, 26. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1, 4. We have passed from death into life. John 5, 24. The new birth brings about a change in our philosophy and manner of living. There's a mystery to the new birth, Jesus said. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. John 3, 8, but you can see the result. Jesus did not attempt to explain the new birth to Nicodemus. Our finite minds cannot understand the infinite. We come by simple childlike faith. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we do, we are born again. It happens this way. First, we have to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, that's the first step. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message, preached to save those who believe, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. It sounds foolish that words from a Bible have the power to penetrate our hearts and change our lives, but they do because they are God's holy words. Then there is a work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts. And then when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, 8. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our, obje our objectives for living and our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Then he indwells us. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Does God, the Holy Spirit, live in you? I can tell you that I live a very different life than I did before the Holy Spirit lived in me. I make very different choices knowing that my temple is a home for God. I take that very seriously. God takes it even more seriously than I do. If we really believe that we belong to God and that this is a temple for him, our choices will reflect that. If we don't believe that our temple is a house for God, our choices will reflect that. If we don't believe that our temple is for God and it is for, for ourself, our choices will reflect that. Our choices will reflect that this house is for ourself and that this body will have no eternal home in heaven. That is very clearly stated in the Bible. Jesus Christ says that we must be born again by repenting of sin. We do not have rights to this home if Jesus Christ is Lord. 
That means we are willing to change our way of living. We say to God, I am a sinner and I am sorry. It's simple and childlike and then by faith, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, our master and our savior. It's not one or the other, it is all. We are willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps us as we read the Bible, we pray, and we share our faith with others. That is a mandate. It is not optional. If there is doubt in your mind about whether you have been born again, I would beg you to settle that now because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. If you have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, please consider now the prompting of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to your heart, please consider now because hell is filling with those who wait. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, John 1, 12 through 13. Unfortunately, the term born again has been pirated, emptied of its meaning, and given back to us minus most of its power. Today, when people tell us they're born again, we're not even sure what they mean. We're not even sure if it has anything to do with Jesus. But Jesus said, here's what it is, Nicodemus. Your religious beliefs are not enough. In spite of the fact that you've been to the top of the pile of religion, it means nothing. It hasn't brought you any closer to heaven. Christians have memorized, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, the gospel in a nutshell. They may even relate to Nicodemus in so many ways. They may be so religious, so moral, and so educated, successful. They may have fame. But you ought to be thinking about what God will think because one day you will stand before him. You won't be there with your friends, your coworkers, your family. You'll be there by yourself, standing in front of Jesus. Jesus won't be looking for your respect. He's not looking for admiration. He never asked us to admire him. He asked us to follow him. He is looking for followers. A lot of people, unfortunately, think that Jesus is a killjoy who just ruins fun, but nothing could be further from this truth. God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, you were created to know God and his plans for you are better than any plans you could have ever thought of for yourself. Commit your life to him and consider what he has for you. I have met so many believers who proclaim Christ and they live no differently than any other person who doesn't proclaim anything about Jesus. These men and women have a form of religion, but the, they have no power that reflects anything about Jesus in their life. One day, God took me through a time of testing that helped me to discover the generational influences that impact people on a very um, subconscious level. I was able to go through quite a bit and m several levels and different ministries of healing. And I have learned a lot about generational curses, strongholds, a lot about fear, control, rebellion, idolatry, pride, bitterness, unforgiveness. And I have really learned everything I can about breaking these things off family systems, off of my own life because I wanted freedom. And I have abandoned every other form of ministry to be able to get out get free and to be able to lead others to freedom. I have nothing against all other forms of ministry. I just knew the impact of getting free 
was so great for me after having been so bound and then having been born again and found out I was still so bound by different things that I didn't even learn about except through God showing me himself many years after I was born again that I have given my life to helping people get free of strongholds, curses, sinful vows, bitter root judgments, unforgiveness, ties to others. I learn all I can and I take great risks to have the freedom to be able to partner with the Holy Spirit and others to set others free to live and not die. I don't want others going to hell. I've had lost I've lost too many friends. I've seen too many die too young. I will never say relapse is part of recovery. I hear it all the time. Back when I started working in this field, I never heard that. People didn't say that. Now you hear it frequently. I will never say that. I won't condemn those who relapse, but I am so grateful that no one ever set that verbal trap for me. I would have fell into it. I am so grateful no one ever said that to me. I will never say sinning is part of living for Jesus. We should never make allowance for sin. We should hate it. We should hate even the thought of it. We should hate the mention of it. We should never make provision for it ever. It killed Jesus. All strongholds are built in our lives as a result of seeking to meet one or more of the seven basic needs that God created in us. Dignity, authority, blessing and provision, security, purpose and meaning, freedom, boundary, intimate love and companionship. Once we believe a lie that God cannot meet a need without our effort, we open our spirit to something from the enemy. And the more lies we believe, the more we invite the works of the enemy to take root in our lives, and the more ineffective you become for God. You may find that Satan has built quite a fortress, not only in your life, but it has been going on for many generations and you may ask for God's forgiveness for entertaining this and you may renounce it so that God can renew your mind and your heart and then you can see God's power released into your life like never before. You can't earn salvation. We were saved by grace. When we have faith in Jesus Christ, you have to believe that you are a sinner. You believe that Jesus died for your sins. You ask for his forgiveness turn from your sin that's called repentance we are here and i know quite a few others out in this field that will help you get into the deeper things that will help you get into the generational sins and some of the harder things to find we've had to do it ourselves never hesitate to reach out for help with that but get yourself free of sin and make sure that you are genuinely born again eternity is at stake Jesus Christ knows you and loves you. What matters to him is the attitude of your heart and your honesty in this decision. Jesus, you paid with your life. That's how big of a decision this is to get right. It was that big of a decision for you and your father. You left heaven and came down and paid with your life. It is a very big deal. We cannot afford to get this wrong. Hell is real. It is forever and it is a terrible place. And you warned us over and over and over not to end up there. I beg you, God, to get the attention of everyone who hears this and beg them make this stick in their brain until they resolve this issue with you this side of eternity 
Thank you for all of your mercy for us, Jesus. That you even cared about us, that you love us, that you continue to try to reach us in spite of ourselves, our selfish selves. Help us, God, to honor you with our days. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me one more day to speak for you. I ask this in your precious name. Amen.